<laughs> the rain made quite an accompaniment. <laughs> 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 um, well, so that was great. Thank you. Um, just to let you know, we do have copies of uh, Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying here, and we also have copies of Borderlands issue 40, which featured Gloria. Um, and we also have copies of Milk and Filth by Carmen. Um, and now we will move along to Carmen who is the author of Milk and Filth, which was a finalist for the NBCC Award and other collections. She received um, a 2001 American Book Award, the 2011 Juniper Prize for Poetry, and recently co-edited co -edited the anthology Angels of the um, American Books. <laughs> That's a tough one. It's a cool title, though. New Latin writing. Um, she's a Canton Mundo Fellow and is the editor of Puerto del Sol Literary Journal and publisher of Naomi Press and she currently teaches creative writing at New Mexico State University. Thank you, Carmen. I'm thrilled to have read with um, Lorianne. Um, I'm gonna read um, some new, a couple of new poems first, and then I'm going to read um, from Milk and Filth. I, um, like Lorianne, um, I'm writing some elegy, although the elegy is about um, my mother who's still living, but she has Alzheimer's, um, which is an interesting way to live. And um, so I'm writing it like an elegy for a living person. This poem is called Beasts. My siblings and I archive the blanks in my mother's memory, diagnose her in text messages. And so it begins, I write, although her disease had no true beginning, only a gradual peeling away until she was left a live wire of disquiet. We frame her illness as a conceptual resistance. She thinks, yet she is another, to make sense of the transformation. She forgot my brother's cancer, for example, and her shock, which registered as surprise with the reaction to any story we told her, an apogee of sublimity over and over. Once on a walk, she told us she thought she was getting better and exhausted we told her she was incurable, a child's revenge. The flash of sorrow was tempered only by her forgetting and new talk of a remedy, and we continued with the fiction because darker dwindling awaits us like rage, suspicion, delusion, estrangement. I had once told myself a different story about us. In it, she was a living marble goddess in my house watching over my children and me. So what a bitter fruit for us to share our hands sinking into its fetid bruise, the harsh flavor stretched over all our days, coloring them gray, infesting them with the beasts that disappeared her, the beasts that hid her mail in shoeboxes under her bed, bills and paid for months, boxes to their brims. The lesson, memory, which once seemed impermeable, had always been a muslin, spilling the self out like water, so that one became a new species of naif and martyr. And we, and us, were made a cabal of medieval scholars speculating how many splinters of light make up her diminishing core, how much we might harvest before she disappears. This is the new love, her children making an inventory of her failing body to then divide them into pieces we can manage. Her shame, our reward, and I'll speak for the three of us, we would have liked her to relish in any of the boons that never came, our own failures amplified by her ephemeral and fading quality. I will be her apprentice. I will be her apprentice as if I were a hunger, because it is our bleak and common future to reverse the sphinx. I study the meander of her logic for context, Sometimes it is like a poem that is not quite realized, filled with hollows and bursts. The bursts are a stranger's wild grief and rage. She asks to go home when she's home. She screams for the things that we've hidden from her. Other times we circle the same spots and I try to be as I know she was with me once, remedy or anchor. I'm a fair to poor copy, but I was born her proxy. That you don't know her is your misfortune. Know what was of her, which was a hot planet's core, a late summer's best light. Perhaps she's still those images, but the center of her is now only in my essay, in my poem. As a metaphor, I summon a soft, pink, vulnerable jelly. 
It is translucent and contains the future. I hold it in my hand and against a lamp because this is our new intimacy. My nails trace the brown spots that mark her losses. Beautiful and sad and strange, I say, because I've made it into something else. Dementia as softening. For example, folding one's hand into a lap is complicated. The same harried mystery. Your ardor for this queen and like an animal in the zoo wearing ruts into the ground. Mind quelled into a pliant jelly. The right lobe flickers on and heaves its vacuum across the scene. A bedlam in all that data. How insinuated are you in the glossy and pitted gyrus of mind? Like the fugue of perfume, practically no substance. Mind wants from its wound, but won't collect. The she of the mind becomes riven, a river becomes a relic. To build substance from that flux. Like living in an outside glass palace, fingerprints dulling all its walls. Um, so this is kind of a different book. Um, <laughs> this book is, um, uh, I, I guess if I had to do it in one sentence, it's um, a tribute album to second wave feminism. So there's a lot of um, reference to, um, I guess I'll, I'll read a poem that speaks pretty directly to, um, to Audrey and Rich's Diving Into the Wreck. It's called Diving Into the Spoil. Down in the ocean's blur, green sediment root, in the fathoms were walked away. The map tattooed on our flanks is more imminence than fish or the weeds. The hives embody the ambition of all, our descents. We find a busted lock on the hive spoilt by salt and barnacle. The treasures are vermilion and yellow scripts that deduce the foul old compass's course. So I don't know what's wrong with me. We find idiom to tell our daughter how every woman's heart swims with searching. Who begat the hives, she asks. We slipped out of the water, and the hives were gone. Fish heart. Water is bitter on its account. A fish hung round our neck. I think it's that I hadn't read this poem out loud before. <laughs> Um, another uh, book that was very, so one of the reasons I wrote about second wave feminism is because I came to it um, as a college student. I was completely, I, I was in. I was in for life. <laughs> and one of the books that I read um, was called um, When God Was a Woman, um, which was a very formative book for me. And I always wanted to write a poem and this was the occasion to do it. When God Was a Woman. When God was a woman, empire was meh. <laughs> when God was a woman, we built schools of listening, and every week we sat quietly until we could hear each other's thoughts. No shadows when God was a woman. Little girls had great dominion and grandmothers were venerated. Sky was the giant bellows of her inside. The grace of God meant flowing and willowy. This was when God was a woman. She played harmless pranks because she liked keeping things light. She made it rain on our collective good hair days. When she met someone who seemed fun and a little mysterious, she invited him into heaven. Then she made her daughter blind for a week, which in retrospect was kind of mean, but her daughter made the best of it. Radicalization. An agitator holds her sign up asking, do you feel equal? I'm, so you and your sisters deride her because she's so public about injustice, so second wave. Your sisters gather around her with scorn and sully her earnest nature. It's thanks but no thanks. I can vote, walk into a pharmacy for my plan B and wear a chain wallet. <laughs> One sister throws an apple into the melee and the unfazed agitator bites it. Her straight block teeth break the fruit apart, which shocks your sisters. But when they've abandoned their mockery for the lure of a choice bazaar, earrings, Ugg boots, removable tramp stamps, a sex in the city marathon, <laughs> you're hot for the agitator. The crowd clears and you kiss her sweaty neck and use her agitating sign as a bed. You scrawl her agitating words onto your belly and stand naked against her muscle memory. Not just the cause, the impulse, the result, but the buzz of lack. You'd like to consume it right out of her, 
that humming electric dissatisfaction. Then you'd like to put it out of your body in the form of a Louise Bourgeois sculpture, milky, blobbing, love the star fuckery of doing it with her and to her, then the sticky pulling apart, the eternal production of polyurethane eggs wrapped in yarn. Hmm. Fragments from the Confessions. Take the jar and crack it open. The jar is a plaster cast of my down there, so take that jar to the end of a tunnel. Defile that jar, burn it, tag it, venerate it with dung and sappho. Don't hang my jar over me. It's my jar, it's my jar. Decoupage the jar with mouths cut from Cosmo, Mr. Death. Fill it with our minstrel blood or the placenta from our collective lacunae. Grow lascivious magnolias in it, heavy-lipped and lush with pollens. The jar houses my illusions of eating men like hairballs. <laughs> Trigger warning. My drag is a kind of elevator. It's like a title. You're soaking in it. It's a courtesy chainmail for your protection. I start my stories with it, and when I'm hungry, it opens the door. The door is pop of window into my soul, deep and meditative, a vertigo of soul. My cruel, divisive temperament, my cross to bear. We all bear it because of our shared ancestry of milk and filth. The daughter. We said she was a negative, negative image of me because of her lightness. She's light and also passage, the glory in my cortex. Daughter, where did you get all that goddess? Her eyes are Neruda's two dark pools at twilight. Sometimes she's a stranger in my home because I hadn't imagined her. Who will her daughter be? She and I are the gradual ebb of my mother's darkness. I unfurl the ribbon of her life and it's a smooth, long hallway, doors flung open. Her surface is a deflection, is why. Harm on her, harm on us all. Inside her, my grit and timber, my reckless. So one of the other figures, and I'm just gonna read a couple more. One of the other figures that was really important to me was Joan Rivers. Um, I remember seeing her for the first time on Johnny Carson and in the 80s, and I thought, who is this amazing, brilliant, <laughs> brave woman? Um, and I wanted to be like her, and um, so I wrote a poem um, based on her jokes, using the, the sort of the syntax and the, sh the rhetoric of her jokes, um, and it's called Can We Talk Here? After Joan Rivers. My soul's myelin sheath is so tattered, even the tattoo of drumming fingernails makes me a fundamentalist. I have no sugar left after 40, if my husband wasn't twisted and starved, we might never turn our sex into text. My parents can't describe me. All they ever see is assimilation and coconut. All they say is, why can't you just build yourself a Trojan horse into the big league? My first marriage killed itself, but it was my fault. We were playing house, and then I took the bag off my face, revealing Mina Loy in housewife drag. <laughs> Before I write poems, the laptop takes a painkiller. <laughs> Poetry has more holes than Swiss, holy and pale yellow and sliced in markets. Our system is so broken, I break for commercials before the Q&A. I blame white privilege for my poor sense of self. All they tell me is this small cell will be your pasture. For 20 years, I built a key from the shrapnel in my head. I write flabby poems, but fortunately, my smart bombs cover them. I knew I was an unwanted visitor to the Paradigm Parade when I saw that my gift basket included nuance and a muzzle. I told Poet X that this house was our house, and he said, the boat awaits your olive complexion, but that's just white persona talking. I wish I was a clone so I could know what I'd look like without the imbroglio. Is poetry fat? Let's just say that the second helpings of unpolitic irony is a buffet. My body is so distended from being vessel and highway, I barely notice the husband's invasion until the leak and the hiss. Here's a Facebook poem. Your data is political. Your presence rises from scavenging pages and words and webs and signs. You've become a target, but without the old spy store gadgets. 
I'd like to know what you know, not just your count. I click on you, then you click back, precious darling surface. We add, poke, text. On my iPhone, you're called the outlier. Your profile pic of a yellow vase is so illusory, so art. Or your skirt flips up and you're viral, or someone else outs you as a double-crossing wife because it's Old West open season on Facebook. <laughs> Pages ripple with alacrity, with betrayal, and outlook keeps the other engine purring and sneaky. Two presences, the real and the fable, vanish before you, and to them, within barcode, a cornucopia of insight, a family's fleecing, caravans of product, blurry pirated video. I'll play Sarah McLachlan over your visage, elegiac, or someone will paste your face onto the porno performance artist baptized with secretion. I'll be the cultural anxiety, and you can be the Luddite will be a perfect pairing of antediluvian, the wine, and digital, the host. <laughs> and I'm just going to read a couple from, um, I'm going to have, I have a La Llorona poem, Latina, you know, you have to do that. <laughs> um, I also have a Malinche poem. So the first, um, the first uh, group of poems in this collection, um, I'm sweating, uh, is um, they're um, based on uh, like, um, female figures, archetypes, mythological figures, or historical figures. Um, and um, that was kind of, doing that kind of work was really popular in the second wave. So one of the books that was really important to writing this book was the an anthology, No More Masks, which mm -hmm. also was hugely formative for me. This one's called Malinche. The native is shorn of the coarse then cloaked in a brocade ellipsis. She figures this a better vocation than that other thing the desert chingadera. They tell her, you're too good for rancheros and for the volcano veneration she'll melt melted into fetters. But she gets banished for her valor. Her first translation, this speech fills our gaps with civilization with my misprison. It sets wild into new fluencies. Her sisters surround her and she asks, they boil the goat's tongue and then what is it? She tells them she plans to inter our dialect into theirs, our divinity. She wants mongrel dictions to add to her arsenal. She wants to be Lord. Yorona soliloquy. The rivers dried up once made of my hair. I've left behind rubble, but it's thinking of all of us that I make a tiny baby funeral of my tears and they make me a reason for beatings. So I had better find the thing I left behind since it was so precious, like the plaza where I used to throw coins and wish for someplace else to be like the shimmer of coins and water, that newness, not the born down appendage like the body is haven as passageway to life. I make death because it's easier in the long-term shadow of this body and its vacuum. Thank you. Thanks for everyone for coming, and uh, yeah. Do you have a question? No, I'm just oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs>